Welcome to Redefining Medicine, an intimate and personalized program that illustrates a different side of the practice of medicine. Our in-depth conversations will focus on the physicians and practitioners who are redefining medicine through their integrative, functional, and holistic approach to health and well-being. I am very excited to welcome Dr. Sarah Godfrey, a board-certified gynecologist, author of three New York Times best-selling books, and lecturer, well known for her breakthrough approaches to women's health. Thank you so much for joining us here at the A4M Spring Congress. Thank Dr. you. Godfrey. Happy to be here. So three New York Times best-selling books. That sounds like quite a lot to juggle with a clinical practice. Why don't we start with your recently published work, The Brain-Body Diet. Can you start with sort of a definition on the brain-body health concepts? Sure. Well, I would say this connection is so essential to health, for women certainly, but also for men. And it was something that I was missing as a gynecologist who was focused on hormones. That's sort of the, the thing that people come to my practice for. And what I realized is that so much of your gut function influences your hormone balance. And I, I think what happens is a lot of people lose this connection between their brain and the body. And when I'm speaking to clinicians, what I'm mostly talking about is the gut-brain axis, the bi-directional conversation that's happening between the gut, the microbiome, the issue of dysbiosis, increased intestinal permeability, loss of microbial diversity, how that talks to the brain, how it leads to neuroinflammation, anxiety, depression, weight gain, but also how the brain talks to the gut. Because we know that high stress, as an example, high chronic perceived stress, can poke holes in the gut lining, can lead to dysbiosis, can lead to increased intestinal permeability. So it's this bi-directional conversation that we need to be paying attention to as clinicians. And we talk a lot about the brain and some of the, the, the factors involved in, in poor brain health. A little bit about the gut specifically. Do you see in your clinical practice certain factors related to loss of diversity in the gut? Is it diet? Is it kind of a potpourri? Well, we know when it comes to the microbiota of the gut and their DNA, the microbiome, we know that there's three really key factors. The most important factor is food. And this is the lever that I learned the least about when I went through my medical training. I think that's sort of the crime of conventional medicine is that we don't learn about it. I had 30 minutes of nutrition when I went through medical school. So number one is food, most important lever. Number two, when it comes to the microbiome, is stress, high chronic perceived stress. So it's got a number of effects as we just talked about. That's the second factor. Third is medications. And I think this piece is especially important, especially for those who are new to the practice of anti-aging functional integrative precision medicine, because it's the proton pump inhibitors, it's the antibiotics that really disrupt this gut-brain axis. And I learned the hard way, honestly. I didn't pay a lot of attention to this. I knew that you know, the subset of the microbiome, the estrobilome, is involved in determining estradiol levels. That's one of the factors we have to consider but I didn't put it together until I took a course of antibiotics. So I had a month of antibiotics, broad spectrum, and afterwards I had anxiety and weight gain, insulin resistance, and this sense of rumination, waking up two to 4 a.m. and I just couldn't turn off my mind. And that's what we're doing with many of our patients when we prescribe one or more courses of antibiotics. So the third factor is medications. It's something we really need to be thinking about. You just alluded to your medical training. Can you give us sort of a little backtrack and what, what got you into medicine in the first place and where you studied and why gynecology? Well, I had kind of a circuitous path, honestly, because I, was, I got a degree in bioengineering as an undergraduate. I was in graduate school in bioengineering. I'm a systems biologist. But I realized I didn't want to be alone with the truth. And what I discovered as I met more physicians, I didn't have any in my family, is that I could do systems biology, but I could do it in a collaborative practice. I could do it with other scientists. I could do it with other clinicians. And I just felt like that suited my personality so much more. So I dropped out of graduate school in bioengineering. I went to Harvard Medical School. I did a joint program between Harvard and MIT. And then I went to the University of California, San Francisco for my residency training. So 
that's what initially got me into this. I also have a grandmother who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease when I was about seven years old. She would start to get lost driving me home from the bus stop. And that got me to, you know, just realize that here's my beloved grandmother aging. She had sugar craving, she ate too much sugar, she baked too much, she drank too much, she loved martinis, she didn't have a career, she didn't have purpose and meaning. And conventional medicine failed her. So we now believe that half of Alzheimer's cases are completely preventable. And I would say that because she was failed by the conventional medical system, it got me motivated to do what I could to try to change the course of illnesses like Alzheimer's disease. Now, women's health is sort of another topic altogether. What I realized is that as I, I went through my education process to become a physician scientist, there's such a huge gender research gap. And so I say that not because I blame patriarchy, although I do. I think it's really important to fill that gap and to bring the best science that we have to bear, especially on these issues that face women differentially. Things like double the risk of depression, higher rates of anxiety, double the risk of Alzheimer's disease, twice the rates of insomnia, 4X the increased risk of multiple sclerosis and other autoimmune conditions like Hashimoto's. So we've got to fix that research gap that we have with women, and that's part of my mission. Sounds like you've been busy. <laughs> One of the themes here at the A4M we've been exploring into is the idea and signs of physician burnout. So you've spoken previously working in this McMedicin environment and, and some of the detriments to that sort of model. What can you share about the turning point for you in your medical practice? this McMedicine environment, and what did you do about it? Well, I would say McMedicine is a chronic problem in our conventional medical system. And I also don't mean to completely blame traditional medicine. It's the system that I trained in. Some of my best friends practice traditional and conventional medicine. And it's so important, I think, for acute infection, for a broken bone, for um, you know appendicitis. On the other hand, I think it does not work. It fails when it comes to chronic disease, and also trying to reverse some of the problems of dyshomeostasis that we encounter, mostly through preventable lifestyle problems. So when I finished my uh, residency training, I went to work at a health maintenance organization, the largest in the country. I was doing research, seeing patients, and also teaching residents. I was seeing 30 to 40 patients a day. This is what I call McMedicine. And, you know, I, the feeling I had kind of in my gut was, this is not what I was educated to do. Seven minutes is not enough time to get to know somebody. It's not enough time to establish a rapport. It's certainly not enough time to quantify health the way that I was taught to do. So I knew that that was not the long-term environment for me. I tried to change the system, work within the system to change it. That actually didn't work that well, so I did that for a couple of years. But the turning point for me was to realize how much my health was suffering from working in this particular environment. So I still remember sitting in my primary care office. Uh, the, I went to see my primary care provider. I sat in his office telling him about my premenstrual syndrome and how I felt you know, old before my time. I had this weight I couldn't lose after having a baby. I also didn't want to have sex with my husband. And here's what he offered. An antidepressant, a birth control pill, because he said, it sounds like your problems are hormonal and you need to eat, eat less and exercise more. So I realized in that moment, you know, the kind of that moment of humiliation as he was saying, you know this, Sarah, I realized this makes me angry. And I had that kind of righteous indignation that I think really can start a revolution because I was suffering and I, I knew that my hormones were out of whack. I knew my stress response was toast after going through this um, process of seeing 30 to 40 patients a day. And so I left his office, went to the lab, 
check my cortisol was three times what it should have been. I had disruption of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which controls much of the sex hormones as well as thyroid hormone. And so that's what started me on this journey. That's what got me to leave and start my own anti-aging, precision, integrative, uh, functional medicine practice, which I've done for the past 15 years. And it really allowed me to construct a different way of taking care of patients that was much more satisfying for me, that was able to treat the pre-burnout burnout that I was experiencing as measured by my HPA. But it also allowed me to have more control about my destiny. And so I think the future is that there's not one simple solution to the physician burnout crisis. There's no one solution to the fact that medical doctors are committing suicide at three times the rate of the general population, which in and of itself is too high, way too high epidemic levels. We know that we have to have a systems approach to transform our broken healthcare system. And I would say that this way of practicing, whatever label that you use, anti-aging, precision medicine, integrative medicine, functional medicine, personalized lifestyle medicine, to me, that is the path. It's proven, we've got a lot of data, evidence base behind this. And what I most hope is that we can reach more clinicians to realize that there's another way. Right. Yeah, and it's interesting, you mentioned when you were in the traditional setting, trying to sort of change that system, which really is a systems approach. I believe there's large organizations sort of attempting this via, you know, incentive changes, support systems in place, not just your traditional HR, but more of a confidential, empathetic type of design and setting. So it seems to be a turning tide a bit, but, you know, it makes me think of just that quote, be the change you wish to see in the world, right? And in a sense, you had to take your reins and do it your way. So your practice now, is it a bit more collaborative? Do you have you know, members to support you? Are you seeing less patients? Or what's a typical day for you and your practice? Well, a typical day for me is that I have an hour, sometimes longer, per patient. Because I think that's how long it takes to really quantify health in a way that is going to you know, provide a roadmap for how to prevent conditions of chronic uh, aging, such as Alzheimer's disease, anxiety, depression, some of these other things we're talking about. So the way that I see patients now is I have a lot more time. It is collaborative. I think that's an essential part of this process. I feel like when it comes to um, the practice of medicine, no person is an island. I don't know who said that, but you know, this idea that we can be all things to all people, that's just not going to work. Like That's exhausting. That's a path to burnout. So we need the collaborative therapists who are thinking about nutrition therapy. We need, um, I think, to bring together all different disciplines, you know, the internists, family practice, dermatologists, endocrinologists, gynecologists, so that we're thinking in, more, in a more collective way and not in a silo disease-based way. So I think there's a lot of models here. You know, when I was still working at this health maintenance organization, I actually left and started working at uh, University of California, San Francisco again, which was a better environment in some ways, but not always. I don't think the solution to burnout for physicians is meditation. I think that helps, but to me that's like putting a Band-Aid on a much bigger systemic problem. So we need a more systemic response to deal with us. So yes, meditation will get you part of the way, but the, I don't think that's the answer. You recently wrote an article on transgenerational wounds really interesting concept at the face of it. Can you briefly explain this concept, maybe as it relates to the study of epigenetics as a whole? Well, we're born you know, with 23,000 genes, plus or minus. We know those genes are relatively stable over your lifetime. You inherit those genes from your parents, but you also inherit epigenetic changes. And I think this is a really essential part of the conversation because it's not just the food that you eat as an individual. It's not just the exercise that you get and other lifestyle factors in your environment. It's also in utero experience. It's what your mother went through. We know that women who are highly stressed when they're pregnant, their babies then have epigenetic marks 
on their metabolic function, the genes that control metabolism, the genes that control the immune system. So epigenetics, I think, is such an exciting new area. We also know it's not just one generation. This can happen with your grandmother. It can happen with previous generations, which Rachel Yehuda at Mount Sinai calls, I think she calls them soul wounds. I may have made that up. I read it somewhere. So I think epigenetic changes are such an important part of this conversation because it's not just you know this one-way conversation of your DNA talking to your cells and talking to your tissues. You can change the way that your DNA is expressed, and that's what epigenetics is all about. Great. So much we could say. We have so little time. But to sum it up, any advice, thoughts to some of the practitioners here at the A4M? There's still a lot of hurdles for some of them to get out of the traditional model or design a new sort of approach. Advice, words of wisdom to kind of help them see that light. Well, my purpose is really to build bridges, especially with con conventional physicians, but really all practitioners, so that they can practice the kind of medicine that they were meant to practice, something that they love and feel really passionate about. So my heart goes out to people who are still in this broken system and suffering. I am a big fan of small baby steps towards transformation. There's some people who just wanna blow up their old practice and like start practicing in a new way, and that works for some people. You, know, you stop accept, accepting insurance, you go to a cash-based practice, you have protocols that you start with. What I did when I first started to practice this way, I was still within McMedicine. And I did two things. I started to talk to my patients about the elimination diet. And I started to talk to them about certain supplements that I thought you know, were the most common nutrient gaps that my patients had, things like omega-3s or um, not getting enough methylators, like uh, methylfolate. So that's where I started. I actually started with just a simple elimination diet and with some supplement changes, customized to the individual. And those two things did not take much time. You know, less than a couple of minutes to go through a basic elimination provocation diet. And yet, I would say it would help my patients with more than half of their symptoms. So it's, it's one of those things that I think is a small hinge that swings big doors when it comes to transforming your health. That's where I'd recommend starting. And also, meet people, network, go to conferences like A4M. I went to my first A4M conference a long time ago. I think it was maybe 15 years ago. And this is what started it all for me. So going to conferences, meeting people, getting the education that you need and the support, having the conversations, that's what's really gonna support you the best as you go forward. Yeah. We're all in it together, so to speak. Well, Dr. Gottfried, you've been a, an amazing asset to our, to our content this weekend here at the A4M. Privileged to have you here, thank you. Thank you, my pleasure, so happy to be here.